We are in the season of Lent, and we are making our way to Good Friday and Easter Sunday, uh, the most, one of the most holy times of the year. And uh, we are skipping ahead in the Gospel of Mark to look at those passages directly before uh, Jesus is arrested and crucified. Um, before we get to our sermon today, as we always do, let's ask God for His help. Let's ask God for His Spirit to come and to speak into our hearts and into our lives. Let's pray together. God, thank You for Your invitation to us that even as we are weak, even as we are prone to wander and prone to leave You, You have invited us to come. Thank you that in response to our weakness and sin, you have not hidden your word. You have not, um, your word has not disappeared like in the time of Jehoshaphat where it had to be refound or Josiah had to be refound. Thank you that you are not bringing to us a famine of your word that we can go see to see and not find your word, that we would look north south, east, west for your word, and just be hungering, thirsting. Thank you that you've made your word so readily available to us. God, would you make this word come alive? Would you speak the living word that can nourish our soul this morning and to, and to respond rightly to you? God, would we be able to hear your divine call to us as we are hearing this preaching of your word. So we ask for your Spirit's help, and we ask for you to empower um, the words that you want to speak to every person here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus has just had his Passover meal with his disciples, and at that Passover meal, he has revealed something pretty shocking. He revealed that one of the disciples, one of the twelve, right, one of his closest disciples is going to betray him. Betrayal, when you, that kind of betrayal is always shocking when it's someone close, right? That's the, you don't expect it from someone that is that close to you. But as Jesus takes his disciples out to the Mount of Olives and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he reveals even more shocking predictions. Jesus says the disciples will all abandon him, not just one, all the disciples will abandon him in fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah 13, 7, where God speaks of striking the shepherd and the sheep being scattered. And as I've just mentioned, this completely changes the conversation because now it's not just, okay, one of the 12 is going to betray Jesus. It's all of the disciples are going to fall away. Completely changes the conversation. And this brings actually a strong reaction by one of the disciples in particular. Actually, all of them you'll see in this beginning of this passage, but really one person really who speaks, usually speaks on behalf of the 12, stands up. Peter, he says, even if they all fall away, I will not. And Peter is basically appealing to his personal strength, his personal loyalty. He's saying, you know what, I have, okay, I don't know about all these other guys, I don't know about these other 11 disciples, but I have exceptional loyalty, and I have exceptional character. They may fall away, but I'm not. I'll be there at the end. And Jesus responds by saying, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. See, it's disturbing enough that Jesus brings up the possibility that all 12 are going to fall away, are going to stumble. But for Peter, Jesus has presented a scenario here that is even more disturbing. Jesus begins by saying, truly. The word here is, is actually the Hebrew word amen, written in Greek, right? A word that expresses what does amen mean? It's not just something that we say at the end of a prayer. Amen means solemn agreement or solemn confirmation or affirmation. That's what amen means. That's why, that's why we say it at the end of a prayer, because we're saying solemnly we agree with what's been prayed. In other words, 
When Jesus begins by saying, truly, amen, or sometimes you'll see in the scriptures, Jesus begin a sentence by saying, truly, truly, that's the words, amen, amen, and then he makes a statement. Jesus is speaking, when he says, amen, amen, with a sentence, he's speaking with divine certainty. This is not just, I think, or I guess. This is, no, this is going to happen. Secondly, what Jesus is telling Peter is imminent. It's not going to happen in the distant future. It's, he's, he says, this very night, this very night it's going to happen. And then third, it's not that just Peter will deny Jesus once, but Peter will deny Jesus three times. And that number three is significant in Scripture. You'll see that number three come up again and again in Scripture. It's kind of like the number seven in Scripture. That's like, it's about completeness, about kind of uh, overlaps with the idea of like something complete because what that basically means is that this is no mistake this is no slip up right oh i just happened to say the wrong thing when you uh, when you deny jesus three times that's no mistake that's who you are right and what is it what is expressing and what we'll see next uh, in a couple of weeks when i preach on the next passage is that you'll see it was deliberate disassociation of Peter from Jesus. You'll see Peter deliberately, three times denied Jesus, deliberately disassociate himself from Jesus. That's not a mistake. That's, that's who you are. If the prediction of desertion was difficult to swallow, the prediction of denial was just unthinkable for the disciples, for the twelve. So we see a very strong, once again, a very strong reaction from Peter and the disciples who are adamant. They will, they will die with Jesus. They will not deny him. Let's pretend for a moment that we didn't read the rest of the passage. We have good reason to believe the 12 disciples when they are adamant and saying, we will die with you, we will not deny you. Think about it. The last three years of their lives, what have they witnessed and experienced? They've experienced Jesus heal people, right? People that have been sick or have been um, mangled, that have been living like that, sometimes, some of them for all, their whole life. Jesus heals them. He casts out people who have evil spirits and demons who have been living like that for a number of years, who other people could not cast out. Jesus casts them out. Jesus even has authority over nature. He calms storms. He walks on water, right? He teaches with a different kind of authority. Peter, James, and John in particular, his Jesus' inner circle, what have they seen? What have they experienced? Jesus raising a dead girl to life, right? What did they experience? Jesus taking them on a mountain and Jesus being transfigured, seeing Jesus in all his full glory and Jesus even talking with Moses and Elijah. So how could the disciples do anything except have faith in Jesus, live for Jesus, even die for Jesus? We have good reason to believe when they're they're saying... Jesus, we're going to die with you. We're going to go to the end with you. We would never deny you. We have good reason to believe that what they're saying is true. But as the cross approaches and as we read on in our passage, what gets revealed to us is a depth of human weakness. That even as they're so weak, that even as they've experienced all these things where they should have died with Jesus, and not denied him. We see the depth of human weakness in our passage. In the next pivotal scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, we begin to see the cracks of what Jesus is talking about when he says, you guys will all fall away. He tells the disciples, he brings his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he tells the disciples to sit here and pray, right? And he he, he goes away with Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, for a more intimate moment of prayer. And we're told that Jesus is greatly distressed and troubled. He says in verse 34, his soul is very sorrowful even to death. Tim Keller, famous New York pastor and Christian author, 
now in the cloud of witnesses last year. He points out that Christian martyrs in history that died, have died more calmly, more in comfort, more at peace as they were being burned at the stake. So what's wrong with Jesus here? How come Jesus can't die like that? How come they were suffering better than Jesus? Because Jesus was facing a temptation and a suffering any no, no Christian martyr will ever have to face, and we will never have to face on this side of heaven. The cross would be God's wrath on Jesus for all the sins of the world. He would experience God's forsakenness in a way we know nothing of. The magnitude of the temptation Jesus was facing was to avoid the ultimate horror, not simply a feeling of God's absence, which we all feel at one time or another, but an actual absence of God, which is his wrath. The punishment of hell, most profoundly and correctly understood, is not simply the torment of fire and darkness and worms. It is what it is because of the holiness of God and the absence of God. And this is what Jesus is facing, where he can't even stand to pray. He's facing a horror that you and I will never face, an actual absence of God. That's why Jewish people, they normally stand to pray either with their ha- hands extended or their arms across their chest. That's how Jewish people stand, like, that's how Jewish people pray. They don't sit with their ha- hands folded and, and, and head bowed. Jesus can't even stand to pray. He's falling. His, his knees are giving up because he, uh, under the weight of the temptation that he's in, under the weight of what's coming for him. Peter, James, and John, they were going through temptation as well. On one level, it was temptation to physically sleep instead of watching and praying as Jesus had commanded them. But on a deeper level, it was temptation to live to their flesh at the cost of putting their spiritual guard down and falling away. And these are words that he will repeat to the church in Sardis. If you remember our series last year on the letter to the seven churches, one of the churches we did was Sardis. Sardis was built on a mountain. If you actually Google it and look up pictures of Sardis, you will see that how impenetrable this fortress was. The, the hill is not just like a normal hill that goes symmetrically upward. It, it was like kind of like, it was a very, um, the angles were very odd. They built it in such a way that it was almost impregnable, Right? It was impossible to invade. How did it fall? The people who were standing guard fell asleep. And that is uh, Jesus' warning to the church in Sardis, wake up. Stop sleeping. Wake up. Be spiritually alert. And that is what Jesus is basically telling his disciples is, I already told you what's coming for you. Wake up. Be spiritually alert. They're facing the basic temptation of the flesh to sleep and not be spiritually alert. And we're we're already seeing cracks. We're already seeing the signs of them falling away. They are not going through the temptation that Jesus is going through. It seems like a very basic temptation. It's just sleep, physical sleep. The word flesh there is not like, uh, the word flesh there literally means, it's talking about like physical. The temptation was very basic, just physical sleep. And yet, once again, we're seeing the cracks. They are falling away. We see the depth of human weakness. And this leads, of course, to the arrest of Jesus, where Judas comes to betray him, with the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin was the highest uh, religious leaders. They were the ruling religious leaders. uh, He came with a crowd carrying swords and clubs. And what ensues is a violent altercation where a follower of Jesus cuts off the ear of a servant to the high priest. Mark leaves it very ambiguous. John will point out that it's Peter. But before the situation gets out of hand and there's like more violence, Jesus diffuses the situation. He diffuses it by basically protesting that they've come, these religious have come to arrest him like he's a violent criminal. 
every day Jesus was in the courtyard. Every day Jesus was in the temple courts. And he, would have, he wouldn't have resisted arrest, right? And he ends with these key words, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. Jesus is saying this is all happening to fulfill scripture. Which scripture? The one he began with. Zechariah 13, 7, but God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter because it's literally fulfilled in the next sentence. That's exactly what happens. The disciples all left him and fled. We see the weakness and failure of the disciples without exception. Exactly as Jesus says, all 12 leave. And just to put an exclamation point, we didn't read this part, but verse 51 says, A young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Kind of sounds like a comical scene to us today, right? It only appears in the Gospel of Mark. But this is an exclamation point on, the, on human weakness, on the weakness of the disciples. Instead of following Jesus at all costs, as the disciples had boasted in the beginning of our passage, our passage ends with an unnamed disciple of Jesus abandoning Jesus at all costs to save himself. If anyone understood, if anyone was going to die with Jesus, it should have been the disciples. And as we get close to the cross, once again, if the disciples fell, what about everybody else? We're seeing the depth of human weakness. Martin Scorsese, um, great director, you know, probably one of the greatest directors living right now, he made a movie called Silence. And it's based on a novel by a Japanese Christian named Shusaku Endo. And I saw, like, when it was released, I was really interested because I had always heard about the, the Jesuit missionaries to Japan who were martyred who gave their lives to bring the gospel to Japan. And so I was very interested. I was very excited. Also, it's, it's a movie by Martin Scorsese, so I'm like, this, this is going to be good. But I, I saw the movie in theaters. I was not prepared at all. It's not what I thought it was. It, I was not prepared at all what this movie was about. I thought it was a celebration of missionaries. It's not. It wasn't. The movie is about two Jesuit priests from um, Portuguese priests who are sent to Japan in 1639 to find, another, to find another Jesuit priest who's rumored to have committed apostasy. Apostasy is when you renounce the faith. And what happens is they go to Japan and they end up meeting the underground church in Japan who are hiding because they are hiding from persecution and torture and death. The main character is one of, the, one of these two uh, Jesuit missionaries who come to Japan and by the end of the movie, he has to make a difficult decision to either step on... So in Japan, this is historically true, the way that they would torture Christians would be like, and make them renounce, is that you, there would be an image of Jesus. And there's a specific Japanese word for it, which I'm not going to say because I can't pronounce it. But there's an image of Jesus, and you're, you're to step... If you're going to... They'll either tell you, you step on that image of Jesus and renounce Jesus, or we're going to torture you. We might, even, we might kill you and, and kill you in, in horrible ways, right? There are Japanese, the, there are Japanese people were like, okay, you like crosses? We'll put you up on a cross. They will put people up on crosses near the water, and then when the tide comes up, they drown. So not only are you hanging on the cross and ha- having trouble breathing, but when the tide comes in, you drown too. So by the end of the movie, this one Jesuit piece, the main character has to make a decision, like either I step on the image of Jesus and renounce Jesus and, and they promise to give him a life of ease in Japan and save the other Christians, or you don't step on that, we're going to torture you, we're going to torture, probably torture the other Christians first, just to torture you more, and then kill you too. And what he does is he steps on that image of Jesus, he renounces the faith, and he saves himself and he saves the Christian community. In that movie also, there is a guide 
When they get to Japan, there is a guide, a Japanese guide. He's a Japanese fisherman. And they get to know him. They ask, they ask him, why are you doing this? It's dangerous to be a guide. And he says, um, there was one time where I stepped on the image of Jesus and I renounced my faith. But um, I saved myself. But what happened was my family didn't. So my family died while I was too afraid to die for the faith. And I saved myself when my, fa- when my family died. So I want redemption. But what we see in this character, this Japanese fisherman, is that in the movie what happens is every time there is a moment where he has to save himself at the cost of other people, he saves his own skin. And it happens again and again in the movie. And it's like this character is such a slimy character. He's a disgusting character. He disgusts us by his weakness, his inconsistency, his selfishness, his fear and lack of courage. And as I was in the theater, like watching this, I felt like this movie will make you feel so unsettled. It will make you feel so uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable movie to watch overall. But I also felt very conflicted. Because on the one hand, I'm like, these characters are so despicable, especially the Japanese fishermen I found was like, this is everything that we don't like about people in our society. But I was so conflicted because I also saw aspects of those characters in me, and that's the whole point of the movie. I've never had to publicly renounce my faith in Jesus or face torture and death. But I've been in situations where I didn't want people to know I was Christian. I've never had to repeatedly deny Jesus or save my own skin. But I have committed the same sins over and over again and heard the rooster crow. I was seeing, like, I was seeing aspects of them in myself. It was really uncomfortable. And in these two characters, basically... One is a Judas figure. The main character is like a Judas figure, and the Japanese fisherman is a Peter figure. The movie Silence is making a powerful statement to both Christians and unbelievers too, unbelievers too, that we are all Peters and Judases. Now, obviously, I don't agree with everything about the movie, but on this point, I believe that this is a declaration of Romans 2.10. None are righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. For all have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. I believe that on that point, I can agree with that, that that is in alignment with what Scripture says about us. We are weak, all of us. Now, I believe much of Scripture is about God's divine call and how we respond. Thank you, Dr. Kessler, who was also in the cloud of witnesses who passed away last year. Scripture is about God's divine call and how we respond. Now, we can respond by denying this and saying, no, I'm not weak. I'm strong. I'm good. I'm a decent person. I would die with Jesus and never betray him. I believe this will lead to what the disciples experienced, being fragmented, saying one thing, living another. In simple terms, we call this living a lie. And this road leads to presenting ourselves as strong, presenting ourselves as good, having everything figured out, always being right, which ultimately leads to being crushed under the weight of always having to perform and having an expectation put on us where like, no one could live up to. In other words, we're setting ourselves up for failure. So this is not it. This is not it. We can also respond by accepting our weakness and making peace with it. We're weak. So living with weakness and sin is fine. 
If weakness and sin is fine, then this whole Bible, you can just throw it away. It makes no sense. If living with sin and weakness is fine, then why did Jesus go to the cross? There's no reason why Jesus needs to go to the cross if, if weakness and sin is okay. Someone might say, but Pastor Ken, like, this, is, this is post-cross and resurrection, right? We have grace now, so weakness and sin is okay. Paul recognizes that, yes. Post, post-cross and resurrection, there is grace. But notice what he writes in Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So accepting weakness as fine is not it either. And basically what that's like is like having cancer, but seeking no treatment and thinking we'll, we'll survive. We're just going to get through it. Only I think like that. You guys should not think like that, right? So we find ourselves now in a catch-22. We find ourselves in a catch-22. Whether we deny our weakness or whether we accept our weakness, we're condemned. And I believe that's where many of us live. That's where many of us are today. We're in this catch-22. Maybe some of us, I've heard it, like some of us here, we've, we just admitted it. We just admit it. Maybe for others of us, it's an elephant in the room that we don't want to admit but we're frustrated with the Christian life because we're living in this catch-22. If I admit my weak- weakness, it makes me depressed. And I can't deny my weakness because that brings other problems. Who wants to live a lie? Who, who wants to live their whole life a lie? Who wants to live with all those other problems that come with denying our weakness? We feel stuck. We feel confused. We feel frustrated. There is a third way we can respond, which I believe is the only way Scripture directs us to respond. Respond to our weakness and sin and get it, gets us out of this catch-22. We look to Christ who goes to the cross. In the Garden of Gethsemane, even though Jesus was tempted to run away and avoid the cross, he even asked, Jesus, he even asked God, can you let this hour just pass from me? Is there any way that this can just pass? Like we can, is there any way we can get this done without me going to the cross? But at the end, he prayed, not what I will, but what you will. What is God's will? To have a people for himself. Not a people who have no choice but a people who will choose God, who will be for God, who will reflect God. A people who will be a holy nation. A people for the praise of God's glory. That's God's will. If you read cover to cover, if you read about salvation history, that is what God desires. Going to the cross was God's pursuit of us when we were weak for that purpose, to that end. Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The cross, it was God's pursuit of us in our weakness to make us the people of God. In the last couple of weeks, um, I was just like so many conversations, I was reminded of God's pursuit of people. God's pursuit of people. I was reminded of my own journey. What if God never took me through a two and a half year sabbatical? Where like, it was a, the toughest time of my life, but I also grew the most. What if that never happened, right? What if God never pursued me and that never happened? I would still think I knew what the Christian life was all about. I would still think I knew what ministry was all about when the reality was I didn't know. I didn't get it. And not to say that I've figured everything out today. You guys have to still suffer parts of me that are not, have not matured. There's still parts of me that I, know I have to grow so much more. 
but I don't even want to think about where I would be today, what kind of person I would be today, how lost I would be today if God hadn't pursued me those two and a half years. God put me in a two and a half year sabbatical of suffering and wilderness to pursue me. There were times where, yeah, there were times where I felt betrayed. There were times where I felt abandoned. There were times where I, I couldn't see a future ahead of me. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was definitely not happy with my life. But I believe there was one thing that I did right is I was willing to have my heart open to Jesus, to go through all these things with Jesus. And not just go through these things apart from Jesus. No matter how, how much I felt like, what is going on here? Why am I in this wilderness? I, the one thing I did right was make sure that I didn't cut God out of the process. And I want to encourage you today, and I think that's the first encouragement that we need and we have to see in Scripture is that don't think that God pursues certain people and not others. Look at the cross. Did Jesus only die for certain people? Jesus, the scriptures say Jesus died for the world. That's not secret code for he only died for the few. When, and when scripture says Jesus died for the world, I take that wholesale as Jesus died for the world. He died for everyone. He's pursuing everyone. He's pursuing all of us. And that's the first thing I want to encourage you, and I think we need to hear that truth today, that it may not seem like it, because in my wilderness, it didn't seem like God was pursuing me. God is pursuing all of us. I want to encourage you that take confidence in that, that God is pursuing you. I don't know what you're going through today, but would you open up your heart to this God who is pursuing you? I believe that makes all the difference. Yes, uh, you know, sometimes you don't feel it. Sometimes you have certain feelings about God. Sometimes you have certain thoughts about God. Sometimes you're angry at God. Would you go through that with God? Don't just cut God out of the picture. Sometimes you're wrestling with doubts. That's, that's fine. Well, it's not fine in one sense, but bring it before the Lord. Do you, you think people didn't wrestle with doubt in Scripture? Have you, have you read these people? Have you read the Psalms? Bring those doubts to God. Don't cut God out. Wrestle with Him and know that He's pursuing each one of you. That's the first thing that we have to know as we are dealing with weakness. If you want to get out of this catch-22, all these things that we're wrestling with have to be done with God. Second, secondly, looking to Christ and the cross means we depend on his strength. Jesus is the one who doesn't say one thing and act in another way. He is the one with perfect integrity and consistency and char excuse me, character. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the one who doesn't live to the flesh, who doesn't ultimately live to himself but is perfectly obedient to the Father's will, even, even as he faced the horror and suffering we know nothing about. When Jesus died and resurrected to, no, to new life, we are told in Romans 6 once again that we have been raised to newness of life so we no longer be enslaved to sin. We can't get out of this catch-22 unless we get to Jesus. And unless we make contact with his strength and his new life. And sometimes, you know what, it will come naturally like a hand in glove. There, there was times in my life that it, was, it happened so easily. It came so easily. Hearing the voice of God was so easy. But there are other times where it's not going to feel good. It's not going to seem natural to us. It's going to seem like nothing's happening There are times where we have to grit our teeth and fight for it. But we have to make contact with Jesus. There's no other way to get out of this catch-22. I don't know some of you here might say, 
I am seeking Jesus. Why aren't things changing? Let's, let's look back to Scripture. Let's look at the lives of the disciples. How long did it take them to go from abandoning Jesus, denying Jesus, to dying for Jesus? It took years. It took years. Just because we have been seeing, seeking Jesus and we don't see the change right away doesn't mean it's not happening. When I think about my own testimony, how, how long did that transformation take for me? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. For Jesus to address things about me personally, for Jesus to address things about me as a pastor, to, for Jesus to address things about me in terms of ministry, two and a half years. I've had friends talk to me about it took them five years, six years, decades. Please don't fall into this have to have it now culture that we're living in. Can Jesus overnight transform you? Yeah, he can. Sure he can. Who, who am I to tell Jesus what he can and cannot do? But many times, and especially if you look at the witness of Scripture, the transformation happens over years, over time. So I want to encourage you that if you're like, I, I am seeking Jesus, but I'm not changing. I am seeking Jesus, but situations are not changing. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. And sometimes it has to happen over years. And sometimes it has to happen in a trial. You know why trial is so important? Because it makes our faith solid. There's a difference between someone who has gone through something, gone through suffering, and come out on the other side in terms of their testimony of Jesus. There's a substance to it that you can't match with someone that has gone through nothing or that is in denial about suffering. Trial is so important. Have you, have you ever been thankful for the trials that God puts you through? Like I said, I don't even want to imagine. Do I like trial? No, I, I try to avoid it, to be honest, but where would I be if not for the trial and God pursuing me through the trial to get me to real places in my faith? Just because it's not happening right now, just because we're not seeing the progress right now does not mean it's not happening. Jesus is pursuing you. Let's prepare our communion. The communion on its most basic level is representative of food. What does food do? We need food, we need food to live. It's sustenance. It gives us life. I also think about our Israelite forefathers who observed the very first Passover. What was that about? They were taking the Passover meal because they knew on the other side of that meal they were about to experience salvation. They were about to experience freedom from the bondage of Egypt. That's what we receive in Jesus Christ. And this is not just symbolic. You are receiving Jesus in this communion. We've received the word of God read. We've received the word of God preached. Now receive the word of God enacted, the gospel enacted, through receiving Jesus through this communion. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the body together. In the same way, he took the cup 
And he poured it and he said, this is my blood shed for you, the blood of the new covenant. Please bring to Jesus your weakness. Let him give you his strength. That is the new covenant that we're in. Let's partake of the wine. Let's pray together. Jesus, we want to just thank you that you're not leaving us in a catch-22 this morning. You're not leaving us in frustration. Even as the Christian life can sometimes feel frustrating for us because we're living in this contradiction of um, us being sanctified and being made holy and being major people, but at the same time sinning and being weak. We're living in this contradiction. But thank you that In Jesus Christ, we're not living in contradiction alone, but you've given us hope in Jesus Christ. You've given us hope for a future. You've given us hope that on the other side, Lord, there will be a day when we will be made whole. We'll we'll have no spot and stain. We will be strong and not weak. And so, God, we thank you for the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the presence of Christ in our lives. Thank you that you have been pursuing us and that you will never stop. God, I pray for each person here that we would not close our hearts to Jesus because there's something that we don't understand or there's something that we are feeling today or there's there's anger or there's bitterness or there's we're not getting what we want or getting what we feel like we need that we would not shut you out, Lord. Help our hearts to be open to you as you are pursuing each one of us. Help us to be patient, Lord, and live with hope that, yes, some things may take years and not simply just moments, but years. Help us renew the faith that you are pursuing us. Renew the faith that Um, wherever we are today, however far we think we are, however weak we think we are, you are pursuing us, and that makes all the difference. If we will just open ourselves up to that. Thank you, Jesus, for giving yourself up to us, for going to the cross. Help us to 